Hello everybody, I'm Mr. Eck and I'm here to talk to you today about section P.9, absolute value equations and inequalities, and also just inequalities in general. Um, this is a pretty tricky topic and I think it's just because it kind of combines a lot of things from different places. So we're going to get right into it with some quick review of previous ideas. Um, and the first thing we're going to review is absolute value equations. And I'm going to do this problem in two ways. I know we did this in a previous section. Here is what you may have seen in previous math classes. Uh, you may have seen that if you're solving this equation, what you want to do is split it into two sort of cases. Case one, where you delete the absolute value and you write x minus two equals positive five. And case two, you delete the absolute value again and you write x minus two is equal to negative five. That is, you kind of keep the x terms the same and you change the sign of the number. Uh, and then you would, you know, solve both and get x equals 7 and x equals negative 3. You have two solutions. You're done. That's not actually what's going on. And when we go further into trickier problems, it's going to be important that you know exactly what is going on here. Uh, and so the mystery is why do we make that one uh, value negative? Well, here's what's really going on. First, I'll say this. Do you remember our definition of absolute value from p dot, I think p dot one, that stated that absolute value is actually two functions. It's either x, if x is positive, or so when you say x, we mean like the number, the thing inside the absolute. It's either that thing, if that thing is greater than zero, or it's the opposite of that thing, if that thing is less than zero. And so we have this idea that the thing inside the absolute value is either positive or negative, and we don't know which. So here's what's really going on with this. We are going to split it into two cases, but what's really happening is the first time, the thing inside the absolute value, x minus 2, could be positive and equal to 5, or the thing inside the absolute value could be negative, or it's, I guess negative is the wrong word, but it's opposite and equal to 5. Then you go and solve both, and here uh, it's positive, the parentheses don't matter, so you get uh, x minus 2 is 5, and x is 7. Here, you can uh, do a couple things. You can multiply by negative 1 and turn that into a negative 5. You can also make this a negative x plus 2 equals 5, and then uh, I guess negative x could be 3, and x could be negative 3. And we get the same answers as before, but what we miss when we do it zooming out in the shortcut way is we miss what actually happens to the negative because we jump straight to putting the negative on the other side. And uh, that does work, I guess. And I will tell you that when I go solve inequalities, I use that shortcut um, when they're equations. But we're going to be dealing with absolute value inequalities. I think I said something wrong a little bit back there. Um, we're dealing with absolute value inequalities. And with inequalities, tracking the negative actually is really important to do. So um, I like to keep that step, preserve it, of uh, putting the negative on the x term, and then I'll move it wherever it needs to go in the solving process. It kind of isolates the absolute value process from the solving process, because they are two different things. Um, so, and again, if you, you know, solving inequalities like, or equations like this, you always isolate the absolute value. It was done for us here. Split those in two, make uh, one term negative, right? And when I say x, I mean like, the thing that was inside the absolute value, and then you find both answers, and I guess I should say check your answers against the original. Quick review item number two, solving linear inequalities. So uh, linear inequalities, linear means that, that one side or the other is of the form mx plus b, and there's no uh, x squareds floating around, it's all uh, x to the first. Uh, and inequality just means inequalities like this. Um, the key thing to remember, and you've probably seen that before, is that you should change the direction or what we call the sense of the inequality when you multiply or divide by a negative number. Uh, negative multiplication or division is the only thing that sort of reflects the inequality around. It flips it uh, the other direction. So if I were to solve this, the first thing I would probably do is subtract uh, 2 from both sides. And because I'm subtracting two, even though I'm subtracting, right, and there's a negative involved, I'm not going to flip the inequality because it's not multiplication or division. So, um, no, 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 that becomes negative 4x 
is greater than or equal to 8. Now, the next step, I am going to divide by negative 4 on both sides. And because I'm dividing by a negative in this case, I will change the sense of the inequality and get uh, that x is less than negative 2 as my final answer. And that's how we're due solving linear inequalities. Um, I guess one, a uh, couple other things to note, instead of dividing by negative 4, I could have also multiplied by negative 1 fourth on both sides, would give me the same result. I could have also divided by positive 4 first, uh, and I guess then I would get negative x is greater than uh, positive 2 or equal to, and then done the negative division and got x less than or equal to negative 2. Doesn't really matter how many steps you do it in, you are going to get to the same place. Just make sure when you're dividing or multiplying by a negative, you flip that inequality. I will also say that uh, looking at your homework, there are more problems that are more complicated. Here is one such example. Oh my goodness, that looks really hard. Notice there's still just a single inequality in there. Everything else is algebra. So like in this problem, you would just distribute all these numbers very carefully, distribute, 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 combine your like terms, isolate your variables, and if at any point you end up, you get a negative x on the left side, you know, negative 5x over there, and you need to divide by negative 5, make sure you flip the inequality. But otherwise, nothing has changed, even if the problems look scary. You have, at this point, I actually have really good faith in your algebra skills, uh, so I think that problems like that are not going to be a challenge to you at all. All right. Now I want to actually get into the meat of this video, solving absolute value inequalities. And I want to teach this by example. So I want to do a couple, and then we'll talk about the theory and the difference between them. I think that's probably the best way to approach these. So our first example is absolute value of x minus 2 is less than or equal to the number 5. And uh, there's a lot we can learn just from looking at the problem, but for now, I'm just going to go ahead and solve it using the same method I used for absolute value equations. We're going to split it into two cases. Case one, I'll just delete the absolute value and change nothing else. Case two, I am going to uh, delete the absolute value but take that place where I deleted the absolute value, put parentheses around it, and make that negative. And then I will keep the sign the same there, so less than 5. So I've taken this and split it into two cases. I'll make a little wall there. Now I'll go ahead and solve both situations. x uh, is less than or equal to 7. I didn't have to flip any signs there. Now here, I am now going to uh, multiply by negative 1 and get x minus 2 is greater than or equal to negative 5. So notice what I did. I multiplied by negative 1 to get rid of that negative. The 5 becomes negative, and I flip the sign. Uh, then I'll go ahead and add 2, and I'll get x is greater than or equal to uh, 3, negative. I want to remark at this time that often Folks and textbooks and YouTube videos will shortcut directly to this step and they'll just say, oh, make the number negative and flip the sign. And it's totally unclear to a learner or a reader why you would flip the sign there or why you would make that negative, why you flip in the sign, um, which is why I actually like to show that step because saying, oh, the definition of absolute value says I need to make one of those negative. Then, when I solve it by multiplying by negative 1, that's why I flip this sign. So that way it's not a shortcut. I understand why I'm going here, uh, I, but I do, in the end, end up with a positive 5 and a negative 5 with inequalities in the opposite direction, which is often where that gets shortcutted to. But that's why that shortcut is true. Um, and I'm not going to be using that shortcut. I really like doing it the long way the whole time. All right, back to the main problem. Uh, because we have, I guess, two solutions, but it's different than equations. When it was equations, I'd be like, there are my answers, right? X is equal to 7, X is equal to negative 3, I'm done. Um, but this is not true. A lot of people would like to just leave this here, but we're missing something. Um, we're missing 
a key word in between these answers. Uh, the key word is either the word or, or the word and. And a lot of people will use those two interchangeably just as kind of like a, a connecting word between your two answers, but that's actually wrong. And I wanna go over to the side and talk about why that's wrong. So, or versus and, in math, we think about or and and as kind of logical statements. They're part of an if-then statement. So uh, here's an example I came up with that's not true, by the way. Um, but I might say, you will get an A if you do all your homework and you bring me treats. In another class, your teacher might say, you will get an A if you do all your homework or you bring me treats. And let's think about the difference between them. The first teacher ooh, is a little meaner. That first teacher wants both statements to be true for you to get an A, right? For, the, the, uh, for you to have an A, you need to do both things. That's the word and. So whenever you see the word and in math, it's actually between two statements. It's implying that both of them must be true for the result to be true. On the other hand, the second teacher is a little nicer. They'll say, uh, you can do all your homework or you can bring me treats. Well, then you only need one to be true. Now, will that teacher also accept treats and completed homework? Yeah, totally. So when we say or in math, we actually mean one, the other, or possibly both. Um, but it is kind of less restrictive. And here's, here's maybe a, a pictorial representation. If you think about the, a Venn diagram where the two circles are homework and treats, we'll say homework and treats, and bring me treats means the center of the Venn diagram must be shaded, right? I required both. In the or statement, I will accept homework. I'll accept, I'll say homework and treats. I'll accept homework. I'll accept treats, but I will also clearly accept both. So I'm accepting everything in the Venn diagram. Um, by the way, we've done these Venn diagrams before. And when we did, we called this the intersection. And we call this the union of two sets. So intersection and union are going to come into play again. Um, intersection is the overlap of two sets, and union is just the combination of everything in both sets. That was in P.1. But going back to the problem, I have uh, two statements, x less than 7 and x greater than negative 3, and I'm trying to decide if uh, for this inequality uh, up here, let's not lose sight, this inequality to be true, do I need just one? to be true, or do I need both of them to be true? And for me to do that, I wanna actually start to sketch out my graph. Uh, so here is my graph on a number line. Let's find a line over here. And I'm gonna make a really dorky number line. I'm just gonna put a couple numbers on it. First number I'm gonna put on there is seven. And I'm gonna sketch the graph of x less than or equal to seven. So uh, because it's less than or equal to, I'm gonna use a bracket just like in interval notation, you would use a bracket for less than or equal to. And then I'm going to shade this way. You can put an arrow, right? Less than or equal to means it goes all the way in that direction. And then greater than or equal to negative 3, I'm going to find negative 3 on the number line. I'm going to put another bracket because it's greater than or equal to. And I'm going to shade this way. And I kind of need to decide, like, do I need, so if I only need one of these to be true, then I'm kind of looking at the entire number line, aren't I, right? Because I have two arrows that I'm kind of like pointing this way, where my arrows are overlapping on top of each other. But that doesn't feel like the actual solution. What feels like the solution is going to be everything where both are true. The solution is everything where both are true and, and the word, if I'm picking or and and, that requires that to be true is and. So if you're going to make your answer, or when you make your answer, you have to pay attention to the word that goes in there. Uh, and I'm going to pick the word and, but now I'm going to talk a little more about why I chose that word and to go in there. Um, and what I want to do is just test values. 
So this is another strategy that you can use. If you kind of have a little number line, um, I'm gonna make myself a second number line that doesn't have the graph on it. And I'm gonna call this just a, a test chart. It's a test chart for the inequality, absolute value, x minus two is less than or equal to five. And what I'm gonna do is pick numbers in each of the spaces between negative three and seven, uh, or each of these three spaces, and just see if that inequality is true or false. So let me check, uh, let's check zero. Is the absolute value of zero minus two less than or equal to five? Well, yes, because two is less than or equal to five. So the inequality is true in between negative three and seven. Let's check a number larger than seven. How about 10? Uh, so is the absolute value of 10 minus two less than or equal to five? No, because the absolute value of seven is not less than or equal to five. So the inequality is false. And it's going to probably be false over here. Let's try uh, negative four. So the absolute value of negative four minus three, uh, minus two, can't read. Is that less than or equal to five? No, because the absolute value of negative six is not less than or equal to positive five. So I can see by testing values that the inequality will only actually be true between these solution points. So if I'm going up to my graph, what I need to identify is the place where those two graphs overlap. And that's why I use the word and. Um, I wanna also talk about other ways to express your answer. I could look at my graph and describe this as an interval as well. The interval from negative three up to positive seven. I'm using brackets there because it is a strict inequality. Strict means let's, uh, or not strict, it's an inclusive inequality. That means it's less than or equal to. So I'm using brackets. Um, I could also do something called a compound inequality. which you can only use, by the way, if x is sandwiched between two numbers. So instead of writing x is less than 7 and x is less uh, greater than 3, when I have that and statement, I can instead write it like this, negative 3 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 7. But I want to be clear that you can only write those compound inequalities in the, the what I'm calling the and situation. You can't always write them, and people sometimes try. Um, so where are we? This has been kind of a mess. Here are some acceptable answers to this problem. Uh, and I would also accept a graphical answer with the correct interval shaded in. So that's uh, four different ways to answer it. Here's what I want you to take away from this example. We are solving absolute value x minus 2 is less than or equal to 5. When you find that the absolute value is less than a number, the answer is always going to be of the flavor that we just found. It's going to be, the answer is going to be a single interval. On the other hand, and we'll compare those later, there is another type of problem. I'm keeping the same numbers, but I'm changing one thing, which is the direction of the inequality. And that's actually gonna change how our answer comes out. So solving this one, I'm gonna start in the same way and the numbers are the same, so it's not gonna be very exciting. Um, but I'm going to rehearse it anyway. I'm going to start in the same way. I split it up into two cases. First case, I just delete the absolute value and rewrite everything else. Uh, now paying attention that I, I have flipped the sign in the problem. Other side, I'm going to make the x part negative. Keep the sign, keep the 5. I'm on this part, so I'll keep solving. I'm going to divide by negative 1, so I get x minus 2 is less than or equal to negative 5, and then add 2 and get x less than or equal to negative 3. Other side, I will add 2 and get x greater than or equal to 7. 
Okay, so I have negative 3 and 7 again, but wait. Let's graph these out. So, number line. Boring number line with negative 3 and positive 7 on it. Let me graph the first one, x greater than or equal to 7. Okay. So that's pointing now in this way. And let's graph the other one, x less than negative 3. That's now pointing to the left. So if I was looking for any values where both of those could be true, I would find no values where both could be true because they're two arrows that no longer overlap. They're pointing completely opposite directions. You can't even see my hands. They're pointing completely opposite directions. So what word do I want in between if only one of them can possibly be true at the same time? Well, then I'm going to want the word or in my solution because or is that mathematical word that means only one must be true. Let's go ahead and do that truth and false test just to be sure. Um, so just like before, you don't have to do the truth and false test, but I kind of like it. So I'm testing the equation absolute value x minus 2 greater than or equal to 5. So if I test 0, that's now false. I'm just going to do f and t for false and true. I'll write it out. But if I test 10, That's actually true. And if I test, I don't know, negative 10, that's also true because it would be like 12, uh, it would come out to be 12. So I have two areas where this, where this is true and X needs to be in one of them but it doesn't need to be in both of them. It needs to be, it can be in either of those two areas. Uh, so here is one acceptable answer format. Here, graphing the answer is another acceptable answer format. The third acceptable answer format is interval notation. Now interval notation here is a little tricky because I need to describe each of those, I mean, uh, refer to the graph, each of these areas as an interval. Uh, so it's going to be, the first one is negative infinity up to negative 3, and the second one is 7 up to infinity, but I need a symbol between them. I can't just have two intervals chilling out there, and so uh, because I want those to be combined into a single answer set, I'm going to use the, the symbol union. And that's the third way to express an answer. The fourth way would be a compound inequality. Um, but check this out. I can't actually write this as a compound inequality. If I try, I get something like this. Uh, I have x, and it needs to be greater than or equal to 7, but less than or equal to negative 3. So why is that illegal? Well, look at the darn thing. This makes no sense. If I get rid of the x, right, inequalities are supposed to be like transitive, like the equals property. So if this is true, I've really said that 7 is less than or equal to negative 3? No way. So be careful, that's what I said earlier, be careful of compound inequalities. You can't always write something as a compound inequality. Um, so you can't actually express your answer in this way. You can express it as, an in, as two inequalities with the word or in between. You can express it as a graph of two arrows pointing opposite directions. You can express it as an interval with a union, as two intervals, sorry, with a union in between. Um, and that's it. And that is all because that inequality flipped. So 
I wrote earlier, when the absolute value is larger than the number, the answer is going to be a union of two intervals pointing in opposite ways. I want to, that I felt like was a lot, so I want to compare these two problems just one more time um, to kind of maybe put everything in a little graphic organizer. Okay, so for the first case, we have, oop, we have the absolute value is less than number. And in the second case, we have the absolute value is more than a number. That's the key difference between these cases. Um, I'm actually going to save that for last. That's the most interesting. We'll do it last. On a graph, problems of this type will always graph as a single closed interval, while problems of the second type will always graph uh, color coding as two opposite facing intervals with a gap in between. The answer can be expressed as a graph where we see above. It can be expressed as an inequality with uh, T I E S, multiple inequalities with the word, I need to zoom in a little bit, I can't write, with the word and in between, while the other one can be expressed as inequalities with the word or in between. And finally, uh, we can express it as a single in interval notation. We can express it as a single interval, like from A comma B or something. The second one is uh, two intervals with the union symbol, which matches with that or. So like A comma B, union C comma D, just in general. And finally, the first type only can be expressed as that compound inequality. Where we would go, I guess if the solution was from A to B, we'd be like, a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b. But the second type cannot be expressed as a compound inequality because the graph is pointing in is two opposite directions. So it, it kind of it would not make sense to write that as a compound inequality. It'd break the direction of math. Um, and I want to talk about I think why is this true? You know, this is all the algebra. This is like, okay, cool. Why? Here's why. Do you remember when we talked about ab, uh, absolute value expressed, we thought, we are excuse me, when we talked about absolute value, we said one of the ways you can interpret it is as a distance. That is, absolute value x minus 2 could be read as saying, I need some space, the distance between x and 2 And here I'm saying the distance between x and 2 is less than 5. So if you're thinking about it like a number line, you're thinking, okay, here's 2, here's x, or maybe over here, right? I don't know where x is, but I know that x is somewhere around 2, but the distance has to be no more than 5 units to the left or 5 units to the right. So on a flat number line, this is basically saying close uh, together. And there's only really one way to be close together. It's kind of being like surrounded. You're, you're, you're close to two. You can't leave. You're leashed uh, to that area near two. On the other hand, this side is saying the distance 
between x and 2 is more than 5. So we have this idea somewhere that over here there's 2 and x is x is out here or here you have to be five units one way or five units the other way but you can't be closer in than that so when you're talking about a distance being more than you could be really far to the left or really far to the right and still kind of count as a, a true part of the statement and that's why when you think about these as a distance it actually makes the most sense um, because it explains why one problem has an interval solution nearby and the other type of problem has two opposite arrows when you're looking at something far away. At this point, if you feel like you, you've got this, go ahead and try the homework and then come back here when you get stuck. If on the other hand, you're like, I'm still a little confused, I'm just going to do a bunch of examples. I also want to say at this point that I am at the very end going to talk about intervals and intersection and union of intervals. So if that's something that's getting you on your homework, I'll put a timestamp to it and you can jump just straight there. Um, but otherwise, I don't know, let's just practice it. So I'm going to do kind of what the book says and say that we should express our answers as inequalities, intervals, and graphs, just to be as thorough as possible. First problem, and these are all literally taken from the book. I think they're the even numbered problems. Absolute 5x minus 2 is greater than 13. First thing I think is that the absolute is greater than the number. So I should be expecting an answer that looks like two arrows pointing in opposite directions somehow. Uh, so let's go ahead and do the procedure where I split this up. So we say 5x minus 2 greater than 13, no change. Other side, we say negative 5x minus 2 greater than 13. So the only change putting that negative in. Uh, let me solve the right side first. That looks easier. So we get 5x greater than 15, add 2, divide by 5x greater than 3. Second one, mm, yeah, let me bring uh, divide by negative 1. So I get 5x minus 2 less than negative 13. That's where I get that sign flip. Add 2. Uh, so that should be negative 11. And then I'll get x less than negative 11 fifths. The easiest way to express the answer is going to be as a graph. So we'll make a little number line. I'm going to put uh, negative 11 fifths there. I'm going to put 3 there. And we can be to scale if we want. 0 would be like over there. Um, since x is less than negative 11 fifths, um, so this is strictly less than, so I'm going to do a parentheses on the number line to say this is a strictly less than, not equal to. And then I'll shade over in this direction. And it's greater than or equal to, th greater than 3. I'm going to do an open paren for the strict inequality and shade this direction with an arrow. By the way, uh, graphing, you could also put an open circle there. Um, I always find people get confused with the open and closed circle versus like zero and stuff. Um, but yeah, these are open circles is the other way you've seen that. Now I'm going to look at this graph. I'm going to say, okay, that's the solution set. So one, that's the graph. Now I look at this and I say, can these be true at the same time? Or is only one of them need to be true? And it looks like only one of them needs to be true. So I'm going to write um, x less than, oh, not or equal to, negative 11 fifths or x greater than 3. I can also write, so that's way 2 as an inequalities, two inequalities with or, way 3. I can write this as a set of intervals. Negative infinity up to negative 11 fifths union, uh, 3 up to infinity. That's okay. And the fourth way would be as a compound inequality, but again, a compound inequality would not make sense.
If I tried to write it, it would be this. X is greater than 3 and less than negative 11 fifths. No way. That doesn't make any mathematical sense, right? You can't have a, a smaller number uh, be larger than a negative number. Or I guess maybe what I should say is when you try to write that as a compound, it's implying that both are true. But we actually know that we use the word or in between or the union, which means only one needs to be true. Compound implies both are true. Next one. I see that the absolute value is less than 17. So again, I'm like looking for some distance that's less than 17. I'm expecting my answer to be a single interval. Let's see what happens when I solve it. Split into two cases. Delete the absolute value in the first case. Second case, uh, write 3x plus 5 but make it negative, less than 17. Uh, let's go ahead and, so I've split in two cases. Let's go ahead and solve the first case. Take away five, that's 12. X is less than four. That's the first kind of part of the answer. And let's solve this. So this would mean that three X plus five is greater than negative 17. Let's take away five. So I get 3x greater than 17 minus 5. That's negative 22. So x should be greater than negative 22 thirds. Now, if I look at the two answers, I do have uh, the situation where x is larger than the small number and smaller than the big number. That was confusing. So it does feel like we'll get the single interval. Here's our number line. We'll put negative 22 thirds over here. We'll put four out here. Where's zero? Uh, zero would be a little over here if it matters. Then x is greater than this. But x is less than that. To be true, I need both to be true. It needs to be sandwiched in between because I have to be closer. So the solution is the interval. We'll just, I'm going to graph it down here and say here, this is my solution set. Which is actually, if you think about it, the uh, intersection of the two intervals, um, if I wanted to write it that way. So this is my graph. That's way one. Way two, I can write it as an inequality. So I could write x is less than 4 and, because I'm needing both to be true, x is greater than negative 22 thirds. Step 3, because x is sandwiched between uh, a large and small number, I could write it as a compound. Like that's a logically, uh, a statement that makes logical sense in this case. And finally, I could write this as an interval, and because it's a single interval, I just have to write the interval negative 22 thirds up to four. I don't need like a goofy intersection or union in between. So those are the four ways to answer uh, this problem right here. Next. I'm just gonna keep doing these. If you, like I said before, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and skip ahead. Um, to the, you know, the very end, or just go try some homework problems. But if you really want some more, here we go. Um, I want to show you something in here, which is like, as soon as you know, you see that inequality, you might say, Oh, wait, I want to do some stuff. I want to do some stuff. I want to talk about what you what you can and can't do. Um, what you can't do is break out of the absolute value before you've split into the two cases. So you can't, for example, subtract two from both sides and get 18. Not legal. Uh, because the absolute value is kind of like a grouping symbol. It's blocking that from happening. But what you can do is within this absolute value, kind of treated like parentheses, you can absolutely kind of do some grouping and combining. So I could definitely say that this is 3x minus 3 plus 2, which really just simplifies to 3x minus 1 is less than or equal to 20. And I think that 
actually is a really smart thing because now I don't have to write as much. So I'm now I'm going to split the cases up. I am seeing that the absolute value is less than, so I'm expecting a single interval answer, just like uh, the last problem. I'll write 3x minus 1 less than or equal to 20. I'll write opposite 3x minus 1 less than or equal to 20. Let's solve both. 3x less than or equal to 21. x less than or equal to 7. Other side. 3x needs to be greater than or equal to negative 20, dividing by negative 1, uh, minus 1, sorry. Add 1 to both sides. We get 3x greater than or equal to negative 19. So x is greater than or equal to negative 19 over 3. Okay, let's graph it out. The solution set is going to be the interval just in between these two numbers. I'm going to start speeding things up. It will be, uh, it should have either brackets on the graph or closed circles on the graph would also be okay. Why? Because the symbol is less than or equal to. So make sure you're expressing that correctly. We could express it as a, a set of inequalities, x less than or equal to 7 and x greater than or equal to negative 19 thirds. We could also express it compound inequality. Like that. And we could express as an interval with brackets negative 19 thirds up to 7. Four ways to express the answer all uh, equivalent. So yeah, with this problem, just do be really careful of that simplifying. I do see folks try that, like, like subtracting the 2 out of there, because it would make things work out nicely. Because uh, you get 18, and then 18 divides by 3, and yeah. But you can't do it. Um, you can simplify within the absolute values. You can simplify outside of them. But you have to isolate them, split the absolute up, and then you can start solving things around. Okay, here's another one. Um, by the way, uh, this one is tricky. I like this one. I chose it because look at all these negatives. Negatives are what mess us up almost all the time. So I said you can simplify around the absolute values. That's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to divide by negative 2. I can do that because negative 2 is outside the absolute value. So then I will get absolute 5 minus x is larger than 3. So notice what I did is when I solved that, I actually flipped the sign. I changed how the answer would like look. Because uh, if I see this, I might go back to the chart and say, oh, I'm expecting one of these. But now, when I look at this, the absolute value is larger than the number. So what I should be expecting is one of these like double-ended pointing opposite arrow type of answers. OK, let's solve. So when I solve this, I can work from the simplified version, split the cases up. 5 minus x is more than 3, or 5 minus x, but with a negative, is more than 3. Split it up. Let's solve. Ooh, now an interesting thing is happening when I solve, because I have a negative x. So I have two choices here. I could subtract 5. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do 5 minus 5 minus 5, and I get negative x is greater than negative 2, which means x has to be less than positive 2 because I have to here like multiply or divide by negative 1. So notice there was like a second sign flip. That's something to just again watch out for when you see a, like another negative on the x. Uh, now on this side I could do my kind of blind move which is divide by negative 1 and make a negative 3 here but I kind of see a, a shortcut which is this is like a negative 1. What if I just distribute that to both terms? Then I would get negative 5 plus x greater than 3. Well, then I can just add 5, and I get x greater than 8. So here's my two, kind of circle them, 
uh, answer formats, and I can look at them on the graph now pretty easily. Here's two, here's eight. Uh, X is less than two. Is that strict? Yeah, so I'm gonna use a, a parentheses. So that one would be going this way, and this one would be going that way. So I do get that double-ended inequality, but notice how easy it would have been to like mix up one of these inequalities with all the negatives floating around. And if I just mix up just one, I get an answer that doesn't really make sense. It's not like any of the answers that we've done before. So it's really important to watch out for that. All right, so there's a graph. Um, I'm just gonna work over here. So here's a graph. I could express it in interval notation, uh, or I express it as inequalities by writing x less than two or x greater than eight. I write or because only one needs to be true, not both. Three, I could express it as intervals, negative infinity up to positive two, parens on both because it was a uh, strict union, eight to infinity. Wait, to infinity is fun. Look at all those squiggles. Um, three ways to express it. I cannot express it as a compound inequality because I'd be doing something like saying um, eight is less than X is less than two, and that makes no sense, so I can't do that. There's three ways to express the answer there. This last problem is a really good algebra uh, combination because I see I have something going on both before and after the uh, absolute value situation. So I need to do some work on both sides uh, or in both cases. So uh, first I need to isolate the absolute. I'm gonna do that by adding one to both sides. Now I'll rewrite with it isolated. So I'm looking at the absolute value being less than a number. So I should be expecting like an interval situation like this. Excuse me, uh, let's do split this up. So I'll rewrite it without any absolute value bars, preserving the inequality, and I'll rewrite it, but negative this time, preserving the inequality. Two cases, let's solve each case. So here's where things get interesting. I have a lot of options now uh, to solve. Uh, let's go ahead and subtract two. So I'll get negative x over 2 is less than or equal to, oh, 0. Well, that's interesting. So I've subtracted 2. Notice I, I subtracted, so I don't flip the sign. Um, now I'm going to go, I need to get rid of this negative 2. So I'm going to multiply by negative 2, right? Because that's going to cancel out the negative and the 1 half and it's going to change the direction of the inequality. So I should get x is greater than, oh, but negative 2 times 0 is still 0. So even though I multiply by negative 2 and it didn't actually change the 0, I still have to flip the inequality because I did do the multiplication. So x is greater than or equal to 0. Other side, I'm going to do the same trick as the last problem where I just distribute the negative, then it, may, then it will make x positive. Uh, so I get negative 2 plus x over 2 less than or equal to 2. Now let's add 2, and I get x over 2 less than or equal to 4, and I can multiply by 2 and get x less than or equal to 8. So I have x greater than 0 and less than 8, I see already I could express that as a compound inequality, but I'll go ahead and do the same order. Let's go ahead and graph. So I need zero, I need eight. I need both of these to be true. Graph in between, uh, it's greater than or equal to, so I'll do a bracket. You could also do a closed circle. Um, you can also write two inequalities with and. You can also write a compound inequality, and you can also write an interval, closed interval from zero to eight. Those are the three ways to uh, write the solution here. Uh, just There's all the notes in one screen. 
Now I want to move on to, like I said, and at the end, I'm just going to talk for a while about uh, some review stuff and, and other things that show up in this problem. So uh, you might just want to pause now and go try the homework and come back here when you get stuck. Um, or you can just keep watching if you're having a great time. Uh, first, I want to talk about is interval notation. It's something you've probably seen before, so I don't want to belabor it too much, but I just want to say that there's some really wonderful charts on page 120 through 121 of your book. And I'll reproduce one of them right here that talks about interval notation. So an interval notation is a way of turning a compound inequality, uh, these are done in set builder, but the, you look at the inequality part, into something where we don't need the X, we don't need the symbols, we just kind of boil it down to what's important, the smaller number and the bigger number. And we use, so A is always the smaller number, B is the bigger number, and we use the parentheses or square brackets to indicate what type of inequality we're looking at. So a parentheses always refers to what we call a strict inequality. Strict inequality means it does not include the, the number that it's being uh, large, smaller than. On the other hand, a bracket like this refers to, and it can be on, on either side, what we call an inclusive inequality. Inclusive means that it includes uh, the B value here, right? So X could include A or B um, in that statement. And we use a bracket there. On a graph, we can do the same thing, right? We just use the same, we use a square bracket when we mean inclusive, and we use a parentheses when we mean strict. The other thing you'll see on graphs is open circles for inclusive and closed circles for strict uh, or for, I said that backwards, open circles for strict, closed circles for uh, when the endpoint is included. And that's all there is with intervals, except uh, I guess one other thing is that infinity or negative infinity, you can't reach it. You can't put it on the graph, so you just do an arrow but because you're not reaching it, that counts as a, a strict inequality where you use uh, an arrow and you don't ever do a bracket on infinity because that's implying that you have reached infinity and you can't do that. Okay, final topic is just something else that kind of comes up. It doesn't really fit in with inequalities except that they, they all involve intervals and that's intersection and unions of intervals. So uh, we talked about intersection and union a little bit above, but uh, I want to be a little more explicit down here. Union, and specifically union and intersection, are operations between sets. So I'd always write set A union B or uh, A intersect B. Union, if I write my two sets, A and B, union was the combination of everything in both sets. Intersection. I have the two sets A and B, was just all the elements shared by both sets. Um, and both of these, by the way, create our new sets. Unions are usually larger than the starting sets, and intersections are smaller. I can just do this. They're both examples of new sets. What we're going to be asking you to do is intersections and unions of intervals. So an interval, if you think about it, is just a set of numbers, but that's, you know, has a lower and upper boundary. It's, it's bigger than other numbers. So since these are both sets, these are sets, I can certainly take their union or their intersection or their union and get a new set. So the result of the union or intersection of two intervals is always going to be a new interval of some kind. Um, it's hard to do these in abstract. I think it's much easier to think about these as a graph. I'm going to do a, you know, just like with unions and intersections, it might be easier to draw it in a Venn diagram. I'm going to do the same with intervals, thinking about these on the number line. So first I need to sketch the interval negative four to zero. So there it is, all numbers in between. Then I'm going to sketch the interval negative 2 to 1. Uh, so where would that be? I'm 
I'm not going to sketch them directly over each other. I mean, you could, but I think it will be a little easier to see if I just put them kind of side by side. Okay, so the first one is going to be the intersection. That's everything that's shared in both uh, or the overlap. So if I think about what's in the overlap, well, I'm going to highlight it in yellow. Everything in between from the start of the green interval all the way up to the end of the red interval will be in that intersection. So it's going to be some interval that goes from negative 2 all the way up to 0. Now I need to be careful um, because I need to decide how I want to describe the ends. And so what I'll notice is that 2, ne or sorry, negative 2 is in both, right? It's included in the green set uh, because it's the end point and that's included with a bracket. And it's also included in the red set because it's just like in the middle of it. So that's going to be a bracket. On the other hand, 0 is not in uh, the red set, right? Because that's a parenthesis. It is in the green set because it's just like in the middle of the green set. So I'm going to put a parenthesis around the 0. Um, so basically, if you have a parenthesis, that number on, on an endpoint, that number is not included. And so you shouldn't include it in the intersection or union. Uh, so that's the intersection of those two intervals. It's just the overlap of them. Then the union would be like saying, OK, imagine that I just take these. I'm going to just do this and glue them together and get a new interval. Oh, wow, look, they're all together now. That new interval would start at negative 4 with a parentheses and go all the way up, ignoring all this, the fact that they were glued. It's just a, a seamless gluing all the way up to 1, where it ended with a bracket. So I'll end with a bracket. And that's how you do the, those intersections and unions. You look at the graph, make sure you, you know which one's intersection, which one's union, and you know, express your answers uh, as either the overlap or gluing them together. Let's do a couple more. Um, I'm just doing all the odds that are in the textbook because I know some people often have questions about these. And when I say odds, I do mean evens, um, as always. All right, so here I'm looking at two intervals, mm, negative infinity up to six. So, I don't know, where's six? That looks like six. And two to nine, so two would be like over here. So here I'm just going to write them overlapped because I have multiple colors and up to nine. Uh, but 9 is not included, so 2 is included, 9 is not included. Okay, the intersection of those two is going to be everything that is shared I mean, among both of them. So it looks like the shared area goes from 2 up to 6. Let's decide on our symbols. Uh, looking at 2, I see that 2 has a bracket in the green set and is definitely in the middle of the red set, so that should be included. On the other hand, I see that 6 is not included in the red set, even though it is included in the green set. It's not included in both. It can't be in the intersection. So I put a parenthesis there. Doing the union, uh, I take everything in both sets. Imagine that they're glued together all the way. The lowest number in the red set is negative infinity, which always gets a paren. And the highest number in the green set is 9, which has a parentheses uh, as given. So I write negative infinity to 9 with parentheses. Last one, uh, some infinite intervals. Ooh, and I see what's going on here. They're trying to mess us up because they, have, they both have a positive infinity on one end. So they're both the same direction. Not going to fool us, though. So we'll start here at 2, included. And this is going all the way up to positive infinity. The next one will start at 4 included. Uh, oh, look at this. So 4 is not included because it's a parenthesis. And it's going up to positive infinity. Okay. The intersection is everything that's contained in both, where they overlap. So 
that's everything out here. Starting at 4 and going all the way up to positive infinity. Positive infinity always gets a paren. 4 is going to need a, also a paren because 4 is not in the green set. So I put a parenthesis at 4. 4.1 is in the green set. That's included, just not 4. Now I want to do the union. The union would be like taking these and gluing them all together. So in this case, it turns out that the union starts at 2 and goes all the way up to positive infinity, not including infinity, but yes, including 2, because that's the symbol we had right there. And it turns out that the union is just one of the intervals, and that's because, it's a little weird, right? But that's because the second interval given was just fully contained in the first interval. It'd be like, it's kind of like a Venn diagram where like, here's set A, here's set B, their union is just set A all over again. Well, folks, if you've stayed this far, thank you all for watching. Uh, please let me know what questions you have. I am always answer them, um, you know, and just try the problems. Check your answers carefully. When you do get something wrong, figure out why. And if you're not sure, ask me. Um, this is can be a challenging topic, but if you practice it, I know that you can do it. Thanks, all. I'll see you next time.